So now I'm, I'm going to introduce Pete Williams, who's the Deputy Director of the Library Services at Senate House Library. Um, and his talk today is called Sound and Fury in Senate House Library. It sounds very exciting. A thousand words for weather audio installation. So I'm going to hand over to Pete now for about 20 minutes and then we'll come back and I'll introduce Jenny. So Pete, I'm handing over to you. Hi, th thanks Nancy. Uh, I hope you can all hear me and see uh, the presentation. Um, so yes, I'm. my name's Pete Williams. I'm the Deputy Director for Services at Senate House Library and um, I'm going to talk to you about an exhibition that was hosted in in my library uh, this year and last year, which was quite innovative in different ways. And uh, then so I'll describe it and then go on to make some observations about its impact on us and our thinking about how we might develop the library space in the future. Um, so firstly, just a bit of background about Senate House Library. Um, we are based in this uh, uh, building, uh, this iconic building in the middle of Bloomsbury in London. Um, its Senate House was designed by Charles Holden, modernist architect. It was, the building was opened in 1937. It was specifically built to house um, the university's administration and also a library. And at the time, in 1937, it was the tallest office build, building in London. Two years later, the Second World War broke out and um, it became the Ministry of Information for the duration of the Second World War after which it re reverted to being a library. Um, and it's uh, a lovely building, uh, as you can see. It's um, frequently used uh, in films and on TV programmes. The library itself is um, from, uh, starts on the fourth floor and goes up to the top of the tower. Uh, it was originally called the University of London Library. Um, and this dates back to a time when the University of London uh, consisted of a number of, of colleges, as they were called. But over the 20th century, those colleges have become big universities in their own right, in some cases, world leading ones, so UCL, LSE, King's. And, uh, you know, now they, they have their own degree awarding powers. And of course, they have their own fantastic libraries. So the University of London has become a, a sort of looser federation, really, of, of the founding members. And so the role of Senate House Library itself has changed and uh, uh, correspondingly, and we've become in some way, in some cases, a sort of second library for many of these institutions, but I think still an important one uh, because and I think our collections still play an important role in supporting the teaching and research at the University of London. And we're still funded by the University of London uh, institutions and the majority of our users are University of London students and staff. Um, we've got a very large print collection of about 2 million volumes, mainly in the arts and humanities and social sciences, and we, we hold many notable special collections. In terms of our space, um, it's generally quite a uh, traditional feeling library. We've got, we've got several very nice reading rooms like this one. This is the Goldsmiths Library, um, and generally... The atmosphere is quiet or silent in, in, in some cases, although we do now have um, a, uh, an area on the, on the lower ground floor of the building, which is a more sort of modern collaborative space for students. Um, two other things just to say briefly about Senate House Library before I go on. Firstly, um, because of uh, the fact that, you know, we originally were the University of London's main library, but over the years, have become a sort of second library. For, for that reason, for the last decades, there's been a constant debate over the purpose and the future of Senate House Library. And um, as a result of that, we're at the beginning of a transformation program, which is a substantial program of investment in the library. Um, and the transformation is gonna focus around our special collections. And we're exploring the idea of Senate House Library becoming a sort of hub for special collections in London housing not just our own special collections, but those of some other University of London libraries. So that's an exciting project, which I'll come back to at the end, but will involve reimagining our space. Um, the other thing just to say by way of background is that the University of London isn't just um, a federation of, of, of institutions, but it also runs a, 
a very large international distance learning program called Worldwide and has about over 40,000 students registered on that. And the University of London also has a number of, of, of they're called schools of advanced study. So um, these are central institutes, for example, the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, the Institute of Historical Research, which are based in or, in or around Senate House. And um, again, the schools of advanced study are relevant to, to this talk. So I hope that's not too confusing, but um, that's Senate House Library. So talk about the exhibition itself, which was called A Thousand Words for Weather. Um, it came about uh, through uh, uh, an art organisation called Art Angel um, approaching us, basically. So uh, uh, Art Angel are um, particularly well known for staging art events in unusual locations. So in the 1990s, they did uh, Rachel uh, White Reed's house. Um, they've staged events in empty prisons, for example. And so they're pretty cutting edge, well established on the art scene. And they contacted uh, Katrina Cannon, who's our, our library director, who shortly after she joined Senate House Library in 2021, asking, would we, would we be interested in um, hosting a sound installation in, in Senate House? And to her credit, Katrina said yes straight away. Uh, and then when they explained the concept that they had, the, the idea that the installation would be to do with the weather and the environment, um, again, to her credit, Katrina realised that it was the sort of thing that, that our academics, by which I mean the School of Advanced Study Academics, might be interested in. And so she got in touch with someone called Charles Burdett, who's the director of one of the, the schools, uh, the Institute of Modern Languages Research, but, but also um, uh, the person who runs an environmental humanities research hub. She got in touch with him and told him about the exhibition and asked him if he'd be interested in becoming involved. And he was extremely interested. So the project sort of quite early on became a collaboration between Art Angel and their artists, the library, and also the University of London Academics. So a nice connection was made and it sort of set the tone for the whole project really, and really fitted in with you know, our desire, which I'm sure you all share, which is to try and connect the library to the research and intellectual endeavour that's going on in, in our university. And, and, we, and this was an opportunity to do that throughout, through the use of our space. So A Thousand Words for Weather um, was the name of the installation. And it basically consisted of uh, three different elements. Um, the first element was um, the thousand words element. So this was a collaboration between a writer called Jessica J. Lee and a sound artist called uh, Claudia Molitor. And it was basically a sound installation in a room in, a, in the library with speakers uh, in which words relating to the weather or the environment or, or temperature and things like that were recited in 10 different languages. And these were the, the 10 most common languages uh, spoken in London. And they were recited in a kind of eerie hypnotic way so I'm going to uh, just try and play you uh, just an extract of what it what it sounded like. I hope you'll be able to hear this. Um... Precipitation. Jalad. Double. Koi. Harun Khanak. Gossamer. And Nassim. Ladder. Crystal. So you get you get the idea. Um, the second uh, element of the exhibition was uh, a, a number of sound booths which were stationed around the library on different floors, uh, which had each had headphones, and they sort of formed part of a trail that visitors to the installation could sort of follow. Um, and the sound booths were um, the creation of a, sound, a software architect called Peter Chilvers, who created a, a sort of playback system which took live data from the Met Office and manipulated it into a sort of sound mix so that the, the, the sound that you heard reflected the weather outside in, in some way. And um, typically this would be quite a sort of strange ambient droning noise. Um, and again, I'm going to display you an example. So 
So again, you, you get the idea. And then the, the third element of the uh, installation was that Art Angel wanted to publicly broadcast some of those ambient droning noises uh, for 50 minutes every day in one of our library reading rooms. Uh, and we chose our periodicals room, which is this room here, which is sort of, uh, as you can see, uh, got lots of sofas. And, and, this, is, and this part of the exhibition is, is what caused some of the problems, which I'll return to uh, in a moment. But overall, I hope you'll sort of agree that it was a really interesting installation to, to hold in a library. And it was very much about sound and the way it interacted with, with the library space. So it was opened, uh, I think, in June last year. Um, it was open to members of the public. They had to pay five pounds uh, to come in, but it was also open to all of our library members who could, could of course, view it for free. And it, um, it was reviewed in, uh, in the press. Uh, it was reviewed in uh, the Evening Standard. As you can see, they sort of uh, uh, only, mod only gave it three stars, I think. Uh, and it was also reviewed more enthusiastically in uh, The Observer who said it was mesmerizing and subtle, uh, but both reviews may, uh, were very complimentary about, about the library. So obviously this was great sort of publicity for us. Um, alongside the installation, um, we also uh, did an exhibition of books. So this was an opportunity for us to show off some of our special collections and material. And so we picked items that sort of explored the weather in some way. Um, and this was this exhibition was curated by one of our subject librarians, um, Argula Rublak, and it was called Weather Notes. And it was a really nice exhibition in its own right. Um, and it featured things like this book you can see in the picture, which is a wonderful book written by an amateur scientist uh, called Thomas Baldwin. Uh, and it's about an early hot air balloon journey. So it's one of the first um, books to include an aerial illustration of the Earth. And as you can see, uh, from the image he's looking down through through the clouds. There were also um, a lot of uh, a series of events organized uh, alongside the installation. These were organized by the School of Advanced Study and Charles Burdett, and they took place over the duration of the exhibition. Uh, the big one, which is you can see in the picture, featured uh, Jeanette Winterson in conversation with Freddie Otto. Um, but there were also other events, such as the ones you can see here, all, all around the theme of the environmental uh, humanities. Excuse me. And we also, um, and, and the libra librarians were also involved in some of these events. For example, this one, Exploring Environmental Humanities, which was uh, uh, feature talks by librarians, but also members of uh, academic staff from the Schools of Advanced Studies who spoke about how they use Senate House Library to, in their research. And then um, these events and the exhibition and the installation allowed us to write a series of blogs, uh, blog posts of, uh, around the theme of weather. Um, and these were written by both librarians and uh, guest academics. So as you can see, there was lots, of, it generated lots of activity and gave us lots of opportunities to promote our space to promote our collections and our librarians and our library services. But it wasn't all um, plain sailing. Um, so I've obviously, I, I, I mentioned sound and fury. And, and so in addition to sound, there was, I'm afraid, some, some fury. Um, as I said, at the beginning, uh, at the outset, we agreed with, with Art Angel that we would allow the ambient sounds uh, that, that were generated by the, the the software to be broadcast fairly loudly in one of our reading rooms every lunchtime. And as I said, we chose our periodicals room. Um, it's the sort of place that people go to relax. But as, I, but as I've said, the Senate House Library is generally quite a quiet library. So it's generally people sort of lounging about on sofas reading or looking at their laptop. And um, so you've got to imagine that kind of scenario and then um, uh, at one o'clock every day, sort of strange noises would start to sort of come out of the speakers, and sometimes they would get quite sort of disturbing. And other times they'd be quieter depending on, on the weather. But as you can imagine, once the um, once the novelty wore off. Um, 
it wasn't very popular with with our users at all and it generated a lot of complaints both verbal and written and these these are some of them and all, and my uh my argument uh, when when i spoke to students that perhaps they could just move to another room uh, at lunchtime didn't go down very well and you know it was uh, i think a misunderstanding on my part of the way people use libraries and and go towards particular spaces so um I contacted Art Angel and said, you know, could they maybe do this once a week instead of every day, or ideally stop doing it completely? But they were they were very insistent that um, that they had to keep doing this. For them, it was a kind of key part of the of the concept, and they basically, you know, refused to 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 stop to stop doing it. Um, so we put signs up. Um, they didn't work. Uh, then Art Angel wrote an open letter to all our users explaining the concept. Um, and then, um, then it started getting sabotaged, actually. So um, uh, we would come in and find the speakers had been unplugged. Um, people had turned down the volume on the headphones. Then the headphones were ripped out. Plugs and connectors were ripped out of the speakers. And for a while, there was this sort of silent, anonymous running battle between Art Angel and some of our, our readers. And Art Angel had to keep coming in uh, to fix it. So personally, I was kind of quite relieved when we reached the end of the project for, for, that, for that reason. But reflecting now on the whole experience, the positives massively outweigh the negatives, I think. And in the context of this, um, RL UK event, I, I suppose I'd make the following observations about, about the installation. I mean, first of all, I think hosting the sound installation was a good example of, of a library space sort of adapting to uh, technological developments and, and being quite innovative, and also kind of finding a way to put our space to the service of, of scholars and researchers, which I think is what we all want to do if we can. And I think um, it raised our profile within the university and, and the wider academic community in, in you know, quite a cool way. Um, secondly, um, I think it, it, uh, it brought people back into the, the physical library. So we were able to use the existing qualities of our library space to bring people back, whether that was to experience the installation or to attend one of the events or to view the book exhibition. Um, more people came into the library. There were about 800 paying visitors during the duration of the exhibition, but um, obviously also all of our existing library members could also view it. And I think we can assume that some at least would have come in specially to see it who might not otherwise have come in. And although I've highlighted some of the negative feedback, we've just closed our annual survey and I've been looking through the comments there, and there's a lot of very positive uh, feedback about the installation in that. Um, thirdly, I think uh, the installation had a really strong um, partnership element to it. So um, hosting the installation kind of gave us the opportunity to foster partnerships with academics within our institution. We hosted and facilitated their events. We kind of brought them together with uh, Art Angel. Uh, we spoke uh, alongside them on panels. And um, so I think that collaboration um, has is going to lead to sort of lasting connections between between the library and the university. So members of our subject librarian team certainly I know are in contact with um, academics within the schools of advanced study, but also I think the senior management team, me and Katrina, it's put it's given it gave us the opportunity to work alongside the directors of the schools of advanced study. So it's very positive in that respect. And then finally, um, I think hosting the um, the A Thousand Words for Weather installation um, has kind of certainly made me think again about uh, the Senate House Library's space. So for me, it was really interesting to see visitors, members of the public wandering around the upper floors of the library, um, which is quite labyrinthine and seeing them, you know, finding it quite sort of exciting and unusual. And it made me remember really what a what a sort of wonderful space the library is. And, and as I mentioned, we're at the start of a, a transformation program, and um, Senate House Library is likely to change in the next few years in different ways. And we'd like to become this hub for special collections in London. 
Um, but for me now, when I think about that special collections hub, I'm not just imagining a sort of big reading room with people poring over old manuscripts, but I'm also thinking about, you know, a, a more cutting edge kind of space with kind of digital displays, definitely with exhibition and engagement spaces. Um, also have the library being sort of visible throughout the Senate House building and perhaps outside of it as well. And I think also just building on this idea that Senate House Library can be a place that attracts people and as well as a historic old building, it can be a sort of modern and exciting uh, space too. So I think in hosting A Thousand Words for Weather, um, that's really had an impact on my thinking and, and Katrina's thinking as we sort of plan the next chapter for Senate House Library. Thanks. Many thanks, Pete, for that really fascinating talk. It's really, really interesting. And I think that's, it certainly sort of jogged lots of questions for me and I'm sure it has for other um, viewers of the webinar today. So please do keep putting those uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll move on now to, straight on to Jenny Campbell's talk and, and we'll come back afterwards for the discussion. So Jenny is the Head of Business and Management Services at Newcastle University Library. And she's going to be giving us an overview of recent space developments and support of scholars at Newcastle University Library and a glance forward to what's next. So, Jenny, over to you. So anyway, thank you, Nancy. Um, and, and thanks to RLUK very much for, for the opportunity, really, to, to come and, and, and talk um, about what we're doing here at Newcastle. Um, today, Really, it's it's quite interesting to to follow on from Pete. So what a fascinating um, set of um, them slides to look at. How, how exciting that must have been. I think what 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 I'm got to talk to you today isn't really a, a massive reinvention, um, if you like. It's more of a kind of a measured evolution um, in the changing face of of kind of our scholar behaviour, um, new ways of working, um, and the, the the quickening of the, the shift to digital that that, that we're all seeing. So again, a, a similar is to Pete, um, a quick overview of, of, of our libraries, nothing quite so grand um, as, as, as we've got in London. Um, our libraries consist of four main library buildings and, and we have some library stores as, in addition. So the Philip Robinson Library is our main library, which covers all subjects except medicine and law. I'll say a bit more about the Philip in, in a moment. Um, the medical library is quite separate on the fifth floor of our medical school, um, which brings with it limited options um, for expansion now. You know, we can't get any more seats in on the fifth floor and, and significant accessibility challenges, um, particularly around emergency evacuation and, and our requirements to, to do that. Our law library is in the, the basement of a beautiful Georgian terrace. Um, which are a lovely set of buildings, but which do bring um, another significant set of accessibility challenges to us. And then our most recent addition is the Marjorie Robinson Library Rooms, which the university acquired in 2016, um, really on the back of us evidencing not having enough library space over, over previous years. We'd run a pop-up library during the assessment periods in 2014 and 2015, because we just didn't have enough space. So the Marjorie is um, a print free study space, essentially. Um, and it is, it's not very far away from the, from the Philip Robinson Library is kind of an overflow, if you like. We have around three and a half thousand seats and our student to seat ratio is about eight to one now. Um, eight students to, to every seat. We've previously managed to keep that around sort of the, the seven, seven and a half mark. But um, since the acquisition of the Marjorie Robinson, we've got, had no further um, opportunity to, to expand the number of seats. So as student numbers go up, we, we're starting to see that that ratio start to, to look less favourable, if you like. We, we, we do think there's evidence that that has impact on sort of student satisfaction and, and Coming back to the Philip, so our, our Philip, our main library was built 40 years ago, well, 41 years ago now, um, 1982, with a, a significant extension added in 1995, Falconer Brown building, um, 
you might recognise that the, the you know, looks similar to other other buildings of its of its ilk. Um, quite distinctive. Like many buildings of its age, it suffers from an aging infrastructure. Now we have inevitable issues with heating, plumbing, ventilation, leaks, which kind of eat into the the funds we have for for exciting things, if you like. So we need to keep this this building sort of functioning as well. On the positive side, it's built on a, a very flexible structure, if you like, sort of designed around um, a pillar structure, six metres apart, with sort of non-load bearing walls in between. So it is relatively straightforward to, 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 to adapt, adapt and adjust the space within the, the walls. I don't want to say very much about, about COVID, if you like. Um, I came into this role in 2018, um, having previously been faculty liaison librarian also here at Newcastle and my first significant space development project was a refurbishment project on the entrance floor of the Philip Robinson Library and we were doing exciting things with um, a new a, a new entrance making the place more welcoming um, introducing exhibition space um, and doing quite a lot of work on that sort of creating a much more engaging sort of entrance space that also included actually a big staff workspace that we were we were looking at as well, sort of a, a space for 60 or so members of staff, a big open plan space. So that was completed in the summer of 2019. And then six months later, um, we all went home and the, the, the workspace wasn't used in, in that way for quite a long time. And the focus, like most people, the focus of what I did switched very quickly to health and safety and one way systems and and all of those things. I'm not going to cover all of that again. We've, we've, we've talked about that lots already, but most building projects were, were put on hold at that stage. We came back again, like, like most of you, with Click and Collect in summer 2020 with small teams or, or, or bubbles, as, as we, we all remember them, um, on campus each day. And then the university em embraced blended working and the, the staff space that, that we'd so thoughtfully created um, less than a year before really was no longer ideal. We had different teams on, on campus different days. There's an increasing need for space for blended meetings, space for people to take Zoom calls, and, and this 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 space that looked so, you know, was so well thought through was no longer really what we needed. Um, so yes, the 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 approach to creating suitable staff space is very much a work in progress and and I, I can't can't say we've we've made huge strides there there's still an awful lot for for us to do um that's probably about enough of the the, the pandemic for now it is worth noting however that we're fairly convinced that the main reason our nss score dropped so significantly during the pa pandemic was due to the restrictions we had to place on on access to study spaces and and was evidence of how valued access to physical space still still is so just moving on to, to kind of what we are doing um some of the context within which we're working at newcastle i'm sure this is the same for for, for lots of you and i'm sure there's things i've missed on here um the, our Newcastle University is very much focusing now on this one campus connected campus approach to developing the university estate. Um, we are represented on the university's estates portfolio board now um, and this this campus of the future group is trying to recognize that you know, connected campus consists of the physical, the digital and the cultural um, and bringing all of those together. I, I think that the bringing the, the big challenge is bringing everyone together culturally. I think we can do things about the physical space and the digital space, but different schools are very used to their different faculty buildings. And, and I think that's the, the big challenge that, that we really need to, to, to get across. A big amount of work, as I've already said, around hybrid blended um, working, um, both for staff, students, researchers. Newcastle has set um, clear targets for, for sustainability, um, aiming to be net zero by 2030. Um, we have quite an ambitious climate action plan. Um, and one of the ways that we're seeing this impact on, on us straight away is in reviewing 
the university-wide approach to out-of-hours access to spaces. And whereas our 24-7 offer, which was once seen as a flagship offer in the university to students, we're, we're now being asked to consider ways of doing this more sustainably, um, looking at a smaller space potentially or minimizing the times that it's 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 provided um, we also see pressure from kind of well-being ambassadors around this this issue as well we're acutely aware of the high value students place on having access to 24 7 regardless of whether they use it or, or not so we just need to be really careful around the messaging and, and comms around this we've seen in the last year lots of opportunity for the library to contribute towards cost of living and and well-being and edi initiatives and this really has helped us open open doors to other meetings and committees in the university to make sort of our our voice heard and share some of our expertise the whole university is trying to to make better use of data um, and this, this university data analytics roadmap is something that we're trying to to, to look at and and work out how we fit into this. We're in quite a strong position. Um, like you all, we have access to lots of data. Um, we don't have a data analyst in, on, our, on our staff. We do have someone that, that supports that role. Um, so resourcing this is, is, is a challenge for us and it's likely to be our focus for the next couple of years to, to get staffing to, to help us make better use of the, the data we've got. And then probably like lots of you, um, we're, we're talking a lot about digital shift and digital transformation and how this impacts on, on, on our space requirements as well. And all of this has had a, a feed into um, kind of library strategic objectives. So coming on to, to thinking about our, our spaces, um, we have a range of types of space. We, we, we do have silenced spaces. We have a lot of collaborative space as well. Um, and we carry out a lot of UX work to, to understand how spaces are being used um, to help us inform sort of changes going, going forward. And the evidence that we've seen over the last year, 18 months, is, is the shift from the balance that we had from silence towards collaborative. So obviously we, we're keeping a lot of silent seating, but we are we are noticing that the, the demand is more for the collaborative type seating. We are also noticing and trying to put in places for, for types of study space that we, we'd never had before. So for space for students to engage with um, online seminars, for example. So they want to be able to, to actively engage um, with, with those online online tutorials and things like that. So we experimented with one such space last year. It was very popular, um, is well used, and this is allowing us to, to expand that into the Marjorie Robinson this summer. So one of our plans this summer is to refurbish one whole floor um, as more of a collaborative um, space in addition to the, the spaces we've got over there. Our medical library is going to have um, additional study rooms added and additional collaborative space particularly in a, an area that is or was occupied by our short loan student text collection we've noticed a significant decline in material being used from from these collections which was apparent before covid but which has escalated quite rapidly since with the the move to e first during the the pandemic and then one last opportunity for study space. Um, the university's last capital build, um, which is the Stevenson building um, for the School of Engineering, is going to have library study spaces that we may be involved in, in helping manage. So at the moment, Newcastle University Library doesn't currently manage or oversee any non-library study spaces. Our, our experience from during, from during the pandemic was, is probably would have been very helpful if we did because we would have had a, a better way of getting some of the messages out about spaces that were open. So any opportunity for us to have a look at supporting some other spaces we're, we're interested in. Um, and I'm very interested in speaking to, to other folk that, that already do manage or are involved in the management of, of non-library study spaces, um, particularly to hear about potential pitfalls as, as well as the, the, the benefits, I think.
our academic skills team is growing rapidly at Newcastle it's 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 a real success at the moment so we used to have a writing development team which has expanded to cover more um, more general academic skills their requirement is for one-to-one -one space um, and we are seeing a real rapid rise of of return to face-to-face one-to-one face-to-face consultations we don't have the space for these at the moment so one of the, the the projects for this summer is the creation of a new academic skills hub with three individual consultation booths and adjoining space for, for group activities we still think this may not be sufficient for demand so we will assess this over the next year and potentially add in some additional type of space next next summer We are part of the university's cost of living task and finish group and one practical outcome from that group kind of suggested by the students on that group was the, the introduction of kind of living room type space. We're, we're not the first and we're not the only to do this, I, I, I am aware, um, but it has worked really quite well for, for us. So we've taken over or adapted some space in the Marjorie Robinson library to make it look much more living room -y. Um, we've added games and puzzles and book swap area. We've increased the number of microwaves and hot and cold water points actually across all of our libraries. Um, we could talk more about the challenges that brings, but so far we, 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 we've kind of, we, we're managing that. We have had microwaves before in, in years gone by and they always, it always ended in disaster and they were gone. But this time um, we seem to be, managing to persuade the student body to help help us keep them clean exhibition spaces um i said right at the beginning that we we introduced some new exhibition space into the entrance level of the philip robinson library um a couple of summers ago and our special collections and archives team have a, a growing expanding um program of exhibitions highlighting our, our special our special collections and archives we there's a there's a constant constant there's a, a question around location and the best location for this because as you might expect what is prime space for for exhibitions is also highly desirable for students to study in um, we're not a huge library so we do have this this slight conflict between um, exhibitions and, and, and study space. So that's that's one that I think we will revisit and, and carry on considering the best spaces for, for our exhibitions. One other thing we have experimented with this year is hosting visiting exhibitions. So that the climate change emergency exhibition you can see is one that was created elsewhere that kind of visited us for a little while and then disappeared off to, to somewhere else on campus. Just before COVID, we expanded our digitization suite in the Philip Robinson Library. Still a, a relatively small um, affair, but you know, we've got much more space now to, to do what we need to do. We created a, a virtual reading room and our special collections reading room. And very recently, um, a virtual teaching space in, in one of the less used PC, PC clusters that, that, that we repurposed for, for, for that. The, the virtual teaching space is is very exciting. We've only really had access to it for, well, since sort of October time, um, but we already have some more AHRC CAPCO funds to allow us to expand the space to accommodate much bigger physical groups um, to, to engage with the material at the same time. So this is one of the projects that is is literally ongoing now and you can't quite hear the, the the walls coming down a few rooms to the right of me but there is physical building work going on to to expand that room um, at the moment the library manages the university stores um, the main one being at team valley um, but we do have a couple of others on on campus um, the team valley 
research reserve holds about 29,000 linear metres of stock, mostly um, less well used library material, but also some university records um, and some artefacts owned by Tyne and Weir archives and museums. Our special collections and archives team are very successful in attracting new donations and gifts. Um, we recently got the, the, the Sir Terry Farrell archive at, at Newcastle. Um, so increasingly our storage is required for special collections as, as well as sort of library material, which comes with their, their own sort of standards of, of storage. And we do have two archival standard stores, both of which are pushing capacity now. So we are considering how to bid for funds for further expansion for, for actual archival space going forward. One of our last priorities for, for this year is, and this will take several years, I think, um, we have plans to make the print stock in our on-site libraries more accessible. We've still got you know, stacks that are two and a half metres high um, and aisles that, that really aren't accessible. Um, the relegation required to do this across our, our libraries is, is no, no mean feat um, and will have a big knock on to, to what we, we keep in stores and, and, and the, the withdrawal of, of material from, from our stores as well. So we think this is quite a long project, but one that we, we really do need to, to start on. So that, that, that's it. That's it from me for, for today, really. Um, we do, as well as all of the UX work we do, we, we do ask for, for feedback about our spaces. Um, so yeah, and we, we do try and engage with our students all the time to, to make sure our, our spaces are responding to, to, to what they need. That's it from me. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Jenny. There's a lot going on at Newcastle. Um, I think a lot of the people on the webinar today would be will be recognising a lot of what you were saying. There's, it, there's so many things that you were discussing that speak to the trends, the general trends in the world, but also in university libraries as well. So it has generated this number of questions that have come through. So thank you to both of you again. Um, if it's okay with you, Jenny, I'll go, I'm gonna go back to Pete to sort of start off with the questions. Give yourself a moment to <laughs> recover from your talk. Um, so Pete, there's been some questions that have come through um, for you. So I'm just going to open them up and have go back and have a little look. Um, so there was, there's one question here that um, I'm going to add a little bit to as well, if that's all right. So um, it's from Karen Latimer and the, the question is, fascinating collaborative project. Did you have to adapt existing spaces or did you already have those required, such as the sound booths? And did you do any post exhibition evaluation? Just a little add on from me there would be in terms of that, um, both the adaptation and the post exhibition evaluation, did that then lead into um, your feeling sort of prepared or ready to uh, accept any further or sort of future similar requests? Um, okay, uh, so. In answer to the question of the sound booths, um, I think we, we we were able to use, we have um, a number of, they're called study carols and they're, um, uh, they're little rooms that uh, researchers can book for typically a week or longer uh, to, to work in the, in the library and they, they work really well as uh, sound booths. We also, but some of them were also in windows actually. Uh, so, um, and I think Archangel sort of um, set them up so that people could kind of sit in the window seats and look outside and listen to the booth. So it was a mixture, really. There was Archangel did do some work to, uh, but we also utilised our existing sort of um, facilities, I suppose. Um, in terms of um, oh, and, and I suppose the, the room where. Um, where the, the the voices were sort of reciting the, the different words for weather, that was actually just a, a kind of it was a it was just a kind of an empty room actually it wasn't really being used at all for anything although actually subsequently we've we've realised that it was a bit of a we, we've we've actually turned it into a, um, a a room for quiet reflection and prayer actually uh, because it seemed to work so well for 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 the installation in terms of um, 
sort of uh, assessing how it went and so on. I mean, I think we're still sort of doing that. I mean, as I said, um, we we just closed the, our annual user survey and there's quite a lot of um, uh, feedback in that about it, both positive and negative, but main, mainly positive, I think. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, generally we, we felt it was a success overall. And like, for example, we're definitely, we're planning uh, a new book exhibition later in the year around um, Shakespeare's anniversary and um, and other things in the future as well. And can you can you expand a little bit in terms of the sort of how how you make sure you get support for you know uh, collaborating or participating or accepting these sorts of requests? Do you have a do you have a more sort of robust process for that now do you feel or do you will you just uh, sort of respond to them as ad hoc um i think yeah we don't really have yeah perhaps that's something we need to sort out. i mean ultimately i think it's up to katrina the director i mean this particular one um katrina was keen on it um our pro vice chancellor joe fox who actually also manages the school of advanced study as soon as the schools of advanced study became involved it was just something the university really wanted to do um the only um so we so there wasn't really an approval process as such i think we would deal with it just on an ad hoc basis i think um because it's not like we get approached like for to put on installations like this regularly but it was quite a unique thing so um that's great thank you okay so i'm going to go back to the the questions now um Yes, yeah, so that was a, there was a follow up one there. So um, this one is from Caroline. Many thanks for your presentation, uh, Peter. Were there many barriers to approving the Art Angel collaboration, given how many stakeholders are involved in the library's use and management? And what was the process like? So this is this connected a little bit to what I was saying. So what were the main concerns prior to the installation? And did these correlate with the actualized issues? Um. So as I said, there wasn't really a formal approval process. I think when, as I said, we got quite a lot of support for it within the university, we would have told a key stakeholders for us are the other federal University of London libraries. We've, there's a federal libraries group. I think they were supportive. The group, I mean, I we didn't really consult with our users, if I'm honest. Uh, the group that did uh, flag up concert, some concerns and they were right, were, were library staff who uh, did ask, you know, you know, why you, there's going to be problems if you have a sound installation in, in, a, in a quiet library. Um, and I, I sort of said, oh, don't worry about it, 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 won't, it won't be a problem. But um, they were right, really, and, and they were right about the reading room not working. So, so I think library staff did raise some concerns, um, which um, we will definitely uh, uh, listen to more carefully next time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And a much more straightforward question. How many external visitors did the installation attract? Do you have numbers for that? Yeah, um, it was uh, the, the number of people who actually paid to come in who weren't library members uh, was 758, which was over about nine months, I think. Um, but as I said, that we also have thousands of library members, all of whom could could view interact with the with the installation. And I mean, obviously, not all of them did, but I think what would imagine a significant number of they, those did as well. So it's a bit difficult, really, to to come up with a, an exact figure for how many people looked at the book exhibition, for example, or 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 listened to to the the sound booths. But um, I imagine it was, you know, thousands rather than hundreds. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna move on to uh, some questions for Jenny now. So some other questions have been coming in. Um, so I you've answered this partly through the presentation, but this is a question. Um, Jenny, does the library have any dedicated spaces for library teaching? And what plans, if any, do you have for these? So I know you talked about the virtual teaching space, um, but do you have any others? So at, at the moment, yes, we do. We have a small number of, of well, fairly small 
um, clusters essentially for, for what was more traditional sort of library based teaching based around PCs. Um, the, the use of those is really dropping off. I think our liaison colleagues will do much more of that type of teaching out on campus now. So the spaces that we're focusing on for for in in library teaching are spaces for our outreach team. So where, where the school children come in and where we actually really, really want them to be in the library. And also the the spaces for um delivery of special collections. So not just through the virtual reading room or the virtual teaching space, but just generally for you know the material that we can't easily take outside of the library for security reasons. So our, our I guess what I'm saying is our on in in library teaching spaces are, are focused very much on the outreach and the special collections um, elements now. We haven't got the space to, to have the, the big clusters that, that we we really would need if we were going to continue with that kind of, of, of teaching space, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions around the collaborative mm. study spaces. One um, question I definitely uh, agreed with when you mentioned this was around the uh, demand for more collaborative space versus quiet study space, because what we found at LSE is a requirement for more quiet study space post COVID. So, um, in your experience, uh, was this the case for researchers or were you mainly looking at undergrad use for the for the demand for that collaboration space? We, we, we think it's we think it's both. Um, I mean, some some of the evidence is taken from the people that are actually in the building at the time. Um, so that will be predominantly undergraduate but not exclusively so we, we we do know from football that particularly pgt um make good use of the library i think for our the, the researchers that, that are in the building that come into to our library they are the evidence we have is that they're coming in to 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 meet other, either other researchers or largely library colleagues so the the research data management team or the open access team so that kind of consultation space mm. um that kind of collaboration is that sort of the, the postgraduate i'm waffling a little bit but the, the, no. that kind of <laughs> space that that we we think that the researchers are asking us for um, yeah. we did experiment with providing sort of that kind of larger engaging space and we just need reason for for doing that so i think our our view is that the the virtual teaching space will will double up as kind of an engaging space at, at times as well mm. and we'll, we'll see how that's that's works um and so there's a related question about the collaborative study spaces um here that says what will be different about the collaborative study spaces you're developing in the Marjorie Robinson compared to the existing ones in Philip Robinson. Uh, how will they work better for the users wanting to actively engage in online seminars? So it's it's what the, 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 the gap that I think we found, and I'm sure lots of, of, of you found as well, is is that space for for people that are working to together but separately I, I, I never found a good way of describing this so they want to work with with their friends but they're actually working on an independent piece piece of work or they 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 want to engage with the seminar that at the same time as their friends are so it's we found exactly it's, that we're exactly it's, it's, the same yeah it's a type of space we didn't really provide for before um so we've done that on a small scale now um in a space of about 20 or 30 seats in, in the philip robinson library um, and we think that the, the Marjorie will, so for example, we're putting in more um, like individual booths as well as next to the, mm -hmm. the collaborative. So I guess it's more of a mix of, of, of a mix of furniture on a, a, a largely collaborative floor, which will allow bigger groups, smaller groups and individuals, but it's definitely not a silent study area. And, and if anyone's got a better way of describing that kind of independent, but not working in a silent space, um, yeah, be, be good to hear that kind of how people describe those spaces. It sounds very familiar to a lot of the adaptations that, that we've we've made as well. Um, so moving on to another question. So for you again, Jenny, the funding you bid for, is that bids you go for yourself or do you get wider university help? The particular one that, that's 
getting us the funding for the enlarged virtual teaching space was a joint bid with um, an academic in English who is very good at getting these kind of bids. So our special collections librarian worked with professor in English and it was a, a joint bid. Okay, thank you. Um, so somebody just posted in the chat, how about parallel study? Quite like that one for the Oh yeah. Working yeah, alongside, yeah, that's yeah, quite nice. Yeah, yeah. Um so this is a, a question for both speakers. So this it can be quite difficult to convince wider university organizational stock stakeholders to invest in library spaces, given that many of the benefits uh, libraries provide for students and visitors are qualitative rather than quantitative. How have you managed this? Pete, do you want to come in? You've been quiet for a while. Um yeah, sure. Uh um, I still, I think the main, the main way we try and justify um, investment or, or is, is through quantitative data. Still, really, a lot of it comes down to, especially um, because of our relationship with the uh, other University of London institutions. We're all, you know, we're always being asked to provide usage statistics. How many of, of your students, how many LSE students coming into the library, for example? So I think there is really, the truth is a lot of it, it does come down to hard data on usage, use of electronic resources, use of books. I mean, but, so, but I mean, I would say that things like the thousand words for weather exhibition, I mean, they're, they are dif more difficult to quantify, but I mean, I don't, I think they're kind of good in a sort of, sort of general way in, in the way, you know, it was good to have, you know, be reviewed in, in national newspapers. It was good to, have events in the library, so I think those sort of things do help us. Um, but it's difficult, you know, in in the eyes of of university management and the wider federation. But it's a bit difficult to quantify that. But I would imagine it must help us. Yeah, and Jenny. Um, yeah, similar. similar. I think. I mean, the the the, the Marjorie, which was our last sort of edition, um, proof of concept was we ran the pop up library. For, for sort of three assessment periods, which kind of proved that the lack of space element. So that got us the, the extra space. Um, we do have access to, to um, a Robinson bequest that we can bid for. So this is meant to be additional funding that isn't for your run of the mill. So we've been able to experiment with small scale on, with, with new furniture through, through that route as well, which, is, which has helped. But yeah, it is a challenge, definitely. Um, things like new entrance gates and those kind of things are just always business cases that we need to, oh. and, and, and they are based on, like Pete says, on, on quantitative um, data generally. Do, you, do either of you work very closely with your respective student unions, I mean, in terms of their voice? That, yes, we do. Um, so things like the, the the library living room came from collaboration with with the student union. Um, some of our extended hours over previous years have been sort of driven by sort of conversations with with them. So yeah, it, that works quite well. It depends, doesn't it, on the on the 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 interests of the sabbatical offices that particular year. So a couple of years ago, we had somebody who's entire aim was to get microwaves in every library and, and that was you know that was that was their their yeah. thing um, and then they go away so so yeah yeah yes it's a short answer we do have yeah. good links with them i mean speaking for senate house library i think we we struggle a bit with that because of the nature because of um as i explained we're yeah we're sort of the second library in many cases for students who have their own home library and so there's potentially 17 student unions that we would need to liaise with and and obviously and it's and it's difficult so we 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 we're trying constantly to to think of ways of engaging with our users and we've had a user forum and the but the, the annual survey is a big a big uh, a big thing for us um uh, but but yeah it's quite challenging i think for because of our unique sort of situation mm. Yeah, so it's a different sort of role that you guys have. Um, so I've got hopefully a couple of short questions here for you, Jenny. So the um, has Newcastle used visualizers for remote access to special collections? Yes. Basically, yes. I mean, don't ask me the technical 
ins and outs of it but yes we've we've yes there are visualizers um and some fairly complicated tech in those rooms and actually that is one of the challenges is it's they're beautiful rooms and fabulously set up but without yeah. the the av support and and yeah yeah so yes we do yes <laughs> all of all of the tech is yeah it comes with yeah you need yeah sorry pete go on you're going to say something uh, yeah i was just going to say that we also um have just launched um I think it's called a virtual reading room service is the, the, the yeah so it's, it's a big visualizer that we're also using to to give access to our special collections actually but, uh, so yeah um and then we've just got a couple more um for you jenny do you signpost to non-library study spaces we do we would like to be able to do it better um so one of the projects we're we're trying to get involved with the university is a is it is a better understanding of non-library study spaces and where they are and when are they open and you know it's not rocket science but then they're not very well promoted and mm. yeah so that's that is something that we would really like we've seen what other universities have, have done with regard to that kind of signposting so we 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 try but we don't do it very well at the moment okay and then we've got uh, one last one here uh are your Marjorie Robinson library room staffed? Do you think the engineering study space, as you mentioned, will be staffed by library staff? Yes, to the first bit. So Marjorie Robinson, we have um, library attendants who make the building safe and clean and you know manage entry and exit and, and all of, of those those things. Um we we do find or we have found that. The feedback we get is that, that the students do welcome having that that presence there. Um, so yes, we do have we do have staff in those buildings that that building. I suspect the engineering study space will be more of a there will be a, a presence at certain times, um, more of a drop in. I really don't know yet, um, but yeah, that that I think there needs to be some kind of presence at some point to make it feel otherwise it's not a library space so we're still kind of thinking at what that what that means and how we brand it and what services we could offer there and, and all that kind of stuff so it's quite exciting I um, mean it's not a done deal yet we haven't been told we can do it but um I suspect there would need to be some staffing and we would need to find some resources yeah. to do that um I think some all the different discussion points here um one question that kept coming up in my mind especially with with you Jenny was around university-wide groups that look at space and I just wondered if either of you know of if you have them and do you does the library have a presence on those groups um, whether it's student focused or whether it's um, estates more generally I just wondered if either of you have uh, aware of that at your institutions yeah, I, do you want me, I can go first on that. Yes, we 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 do. So Newcastle has a very newly set up estates portfolio board that cuts across the whole university. Um, it has some very high, you know, some 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 strong ideals of this this one campus, this connected campus, and and the the, the proof yet to be seen. But but yes, in theory that we are supposed to be looking at the, the campus more holistically and, and how all the bits of it fit together. Um, and we do have a voice on that. So that's, that's good. Um, yeah, absolutely. And Pete, do you have something at Senate House a bit like that? Or? Yeah, there's a, there's a kind of there's the University of London kind of, there's a sort of estates, the, the estates team are currently kind of reviewing the, the estate um, and we're you know doing our utmost to make sure that our sort of plans for the library are included in that I think that's that's the challenge um uh so yeah I mean a, a, a good example of but, but sometimes things do happen I suppose without the library being kind of directly consulted so for example I mentioned we've got there's a new study space on the lower ground floor of Senate House uh, which is called Bloom and it's uh, provides mm -hmm. sort of Space that um, we can't really provide upstairs, but it wasn't actually really a library space as such. It was just sort of created by the university. But actually, after it was created, no one was really owning it. So actually, we've been able to kind of go in and and sort of it's became a, become a sort of 
raise our library space really and you now mm. need a library card to get in so yeah i think um uh, that's an example of a sort of sort of non-library space that we're sort of semi-managing now but yeah thank you and i, I think a, a more much sort of broader wider more long-term question or consideration i think both of you have spoken really eloquently to the fact that libraries adapt um, you know, we have space it's, we've, for the very, very long time. We've been used to storage um, and we've been used to study space as well. But I think both of you in very different ways have spoken to that need for libraries to be very flexible. And I just wonder if you can both say a little bit more about that in terms of the nature of that flexible flexibility and the sort of uh, skills and experience and knowledge that has to go with that in order to adapt to whatever's thrown at us, frankly. Um, I just wondered if, you, if you'd had any sort of broader, more grander thoughts around that. You want to go I don't there? know who wants to go for this. <laughs> Pete, do you want to go first? Okay. Uh, I mean, um, I don't know if I've got any grand thoughts, really. Um, I mean, we are, because we're in a sort of listed building, it, there's a sort of there is some limitations actually on, on what we can do uh, within the space um but yeah certainly you know an, ob an obvious thing is that we're thinking about having less kind of unused print collections on you know taking up the space and, and maybe trying to to move those to another location to make more of, mm. of the space that we the limited space that we have within the building so that'd be one example um that's interesting. Actually, yeah. that's just chimed in with a, a question we had even before um, either of you had done your done your talks around digital resources and the new the need to um, withdraw mm. print print volumes and what should be done to make use of the space. Um, so that I think that definitely speaks to that as well in terms of how we've all shifted or have been trying to shift sort of you know print material out. Jenny, do you want to yeah. say something about the yeah 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 again, not, nothing particularly grand in particular, but I think we we we're trying to fit in with the university kind of funding cycle as well. So you you mm. you know trying to have these ideas now that we can implement next summer because that's when the funding comes around. So it's there's an element of of really having to to know now what we want in a year's mm. time, but then in the interim tweaking at the edges and doing what we can. So things like the living room was a was a something with that just came out of the blue. So it's yeah, it's that balance, I think, about opportunity and and planning, I suppose, um, which, which again isn't isn't rocket science, but yeah, and it's knowing what 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 it's it's that it's that user experience and knowing what our yeah. our, our students need and and researchers, and spending the time getting that information is is yeah is is time consuming and yeah. Yeah, I think I think and as somebody just put in the chat there, I think they we are very good at adapting and and responding to what our users need. I think we're in this business because we like to solve problems. And part of that is what do our users need at any one time? And that's been changing very, very quickly in, in the past few years. 